okay, we'll have to go on to exercise power and control must be exercised over the things that are valued in society. Power can rest on various power bases, but control of economic resources provides a continuous and important base of power in society. Yes, sir. And the other part of that letter I told Dinkin was, was, was this. You were talking about race harmony. There's not going to be any race harmony in this city, in this country, and in this world as long as there is the economic imbalance between our people. It's not going to happen. No singing of love songs between races is going to solve this problem. There has to be a change in the economic power of African people and other people. And I told the New York Times that time, too, you want the black community to smile while it is being economically sodomized. And it's not going to happen. And how cool will you be if the Japanese took 95 cents out of every American dollar and shipped it to Japan? And yet that is what is happening to Africans and African Americans who only spend a nickel out of every dollar with themselves and get 95 cents out of every dollar that they make to another people. And we are supposed to be happy. And yet old throw up Bush is having all kinds of connections because of what? A trade imbalance. Because what? Too much money is leaving the United States and going to Japan and going to other nations. He knows that if this continues, the United States as a nation will deteriorate and fall into the dust. He knows that it will collapse in social and political chaos. You cannot unemploy a nation and a people. You cannot take out the nation's wealth and send it to other parts of the world and it continues as a nation. Following in the shipment of wealth outside of the nation is economic, political, and social chaos and destruction. That is why in the end when it comes down to read to the real cases, the United States will have to deliver a message to the Japanese just the way Kissinger delivered a message to the Arabs. We are not going to let you strangle us to death. And before we do that, we will end your life. Yes. yes. This is the action of nations and people. You understand? You do not sacrifice your children. You do not sacrifice the social harmony of your neighborhoods in the name of any doggone principle to another people. That's right. I've told you before, part of black on black violence is a result of the fact that the black community is subsidizing other people, families, and children. You owe nothing to Koreans. You know of nothing to Indians from India. I remember Dr. Clark saying, what? We as people don't owe anybody nothing but what?
colonial people reduced their crime wave. And of course they claimed it was due to their moral superiority. <laughs> you see. But actually what we did was finance what they call their moral superiority. I tell many middle class, now be careful. You think that you are good. You know, you are intrinsically good. You are only good because you can afford to be good. Thank you. Yeah. The true test of your goodness and morality is when all of your money is gone. The largest percentage of people's morality is bought with money. Yes. And we saw the European criminal uh, poor and bagging doing what first? Murdering, killing, and raping. Right. Yes. Claiming he was coming over here for freedom of religion. <laughs> and then after he raped and colonized and set up a system for robbing the colonial people, all of a sudden he became what? Morally superior. <laughs> I talked about it like on black violence, something called the structuration of crime. And what I try to get across it there is that the type of crime a person commits is related to their class level, not to their criminality. You see, people can be equally criminal across class. Oh yes. But depending on what class you're in, you will commit certain crimes. Why should an accountant go out in the street and mug somebody
13 minutes later, be true. <laughs> so remember this fluctuation of crime. Now I want to quickly point out some things here, some of them you know, in terms of uh, economic differences. I showed you last, I, I think I mentioned the last time you were here, I was here about the Asian businesses and their growth. Remember we said the number of businesses owned by Asian Americans increased by 9.89, that is 989% between 1982 and 1987, a rate more than six times greater than the growth rate for all U.S. businesses between 1982 and 1987, which was only 14%. The growth rate compares to 80% for Latino, 57% for women, and 38% for African American owned businesses. This money by the Asian will be transformed into power. Yes. Transformed into status. And when we become a part of the Asian juggernaut. How many people saw this piece with Sun Moon Young last night? Yes. A man uh, uh, beginning to have a major impact on U.S. policy thinking behavior, ideology, and so forth, because he had what? Money. Money. Millions. Who can run a paper that loses $50 million a year and still keep it going. The Washington Times. Let's look quickly again. Uh, at, a, at, at, a, at another situation here. Ethnic road to riches. The immigrant job specialty. New York Times, 1292. When Parmi Jit Singh left his job as a mechanic on a green ship in 1981, he settled in New York City instead of returning to the family farm in India. After working three years as a busboy and a cook in a Greek restaurant, Mr. Singh met a fellow from Javi who owned a gas station in the city. He taught me how to run a station, the 32-year-old Indian recalled. It's very hard work, but it's easy to run, to order gas, to clean, to keep the books. By 1990, Mr. Singh, with an Indian partner, owned 13 gas stations in the New York City area. What's going on here, ladies and gentlemen? He has competitors, however, chiefly other Punjabi cheeks, who began buying and working in gas stations in the city at the same time he did, some of whom own as many as 40. Where, the, where have we been? What's going on here? Don't we use gas? Or do we only? Well, let's see. Just a decade, just a decade ago, gas station ownership usually mirrored the ethnic makeup of the surrounding neighborhood. But, but now, about 40% of the city stations are run, are owned by South Asians, estimated Linda Sachs. 40% of the stations. And what they, what, what, to what do they attribute to this? They have also developed their own specialized niches, virtually monopolizing certain businesses and professions, and slowly changing the commercial, political, and cultural profile of the city. It takes more than love. It takes more than racial harmony. You've got to move into the And there are many other things here. The common thread linking all immigrant niches is the insider's edge on the profession. Recruiting through ethnic network is the most efficient way the employer gets labor. More than 85% of the 1,600 green grocery stores in metropolitan area owned and run by Koreans. And it goes on here, but I just want to read one final thing. There's some other things in there I'd like to bring. An estimated 100,000 Koreans have come to the metropolitan area since the 1970s, and 65% of Korean families own at least one business. Okay? This is ethnicity. This is where you go when you think in terms of ethnicity. They go on here, I have an article here. Asians turn in Silicon Valley. How many people are familiar with Silicon Valley? The very area where the American computer industry and electronic industry is developed in California. And they talk about here, once engineers, now entrepreneurs. 
Asian immigrants have long made up a large portion of the engineers in Silicon Valley. Now a growing number of starting high technology enterprises eager for more responsibility and frustrated by opportunities for advancement in many countries. These entrepreneurs, particularly those of Chinese descent, are setting up networks of contact and forging business links with East Asia. What's going on here? The transfer of technology and information to the Asian realm in the world because they plan to make this next century the Asian century. This is what's going on. Are they hollering about racism? No. Are they complaining and moaning and groaning? No. They are taking care of what? Yes. Another thing here. McDonald's rich Taiwanese backer. They talk about here, and I just read in the, in the interest of time, the Taiwan Aerospace Corporation is no fly-by-night operation, but rather the high priority venture of a government, an organized set of people, right? Uh, with 76 billion in foreign exchange reserves, more than any other nation. The prospect of Taiwan's buying a major interest in McDonald's, in McDonald, the largest American manufacturer of civilian aircraft after the Boeing Company, has a sign that this island's economy is coming of age and entering the world of international partnerships and investment. What is going on here? Maybe these Taiwanese are literally buying American technology. They are buying America's second largest military producer and will now, in a sense, buy themselves into the aerospace race. This would be the role of African Americans. We do not need to start the African continent at ground zero. We can jumpstart the African continent into the space age, into the, uh, into the aerospace age, if we decide as African Americans to take over large portions of the American aerospace industry and space industry and connect it with our African brothers. But you have to do it. Two retailers reach out to minorities, hoping to stimulate sales among minority shoppers to the largest retailers. Kmart Corporation and Toys R Us Incorporated and hired advertising agencies that specialize in marketing to black and Hispanic Americans. Why do you call yourself poor when people prospect for gold in your neighborhood? Huh? You don't get money from poor people. I'm telling you, Toys R Us, Kmart, Walmart, and these other people uh, see us as what? Wealthy. They would not be prospecting among us if they knew that wealth was not here. We are the only ones blind to our own wealth as a people. They go on here, they're hiring minority agencies to produce direct marketing and so forth. They're going to put this stuff in black magazines because they what they underscore the increasing clout of black consumers who spend an estimated $250 billion a year and Spanish consumers who spend about 175 billions a year. These minorities make up a growing proportion of the overall population as retailers anticipate by singling out minority markets for special attention. You got money. You got power. And we'll talk about that in a second. Dollar General. What recession? <laughs> the recession is not going to hard time to all retailers. You see, people talk about the retailers who were suffering during Christmas. Not all retailers suffered during Christmas. The Dollar General Corporation which sells inexpensive necessities like toothpaste, bleach, paper towels to low-income consumers is growing at a pace that is the envy of merchants with more affluent customers. Instead, last week it reported the best Christmas selling season in the history of the company. Where are they getting that money from? Let's read it quickly. With 1,000 500 stores in 23 states concentrated in the southeast and parts of the Midwest. Dollar General is one of the few large chains to focus expressly on serving low-income people. <laughs> Understand? They're not suffering from the depression. They're making money. Why? Because they're selling to low-income people. Because they know that's where the wealth is, you see? And they know more about our market than we do. Because we don't study our market. 
We don't understand our market. We don't research our market. We don't teach as a part of African Centered Education the study of markets, advertising, and all of the other things. African Centered Education is not multicultural education because it involves self-understanding. And you must understand yourself and your own potential first before you can engage in trying to understand other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more. I think you heard Mark read this one, so I'll just mention it briefly. Thriving where others won't go. Mario Diaz stood hands on hips in the front of a Sea Town grocery store, and we know that helps. He looked as if he owned the place, which he does. How many Dominicans do you know in the supermarket business? He asked his friend Teodoro Cortez. <laughs> and it goes on here, I'm just going to skip a little bit. The Sea Town Group alone reports that about half of its 167 stores, mostly in the New York area, are owned by Dominicans. A group of dark skinned people, darker than Puerto Ricans, but who distance themselves even further than Puerto Ricans from African people. True. I know you don't want to deal with it because you keep saying Latino and black all the time. Right. You're going to learn one day and I'm going to tell you right here. And it's unpleasant. But one day, the major group you will be struggling against will be Latinos. alliances at this time? Fine. But you enter alliances and coalitions in terms of your what? Interest. Okay? You're not getting married. Okay? In terms of your interest. Because you have something they need and they have something we need and we mutually move on together knowing though at some point we also may be enemies. Oh yes, you don't want to deal with it. But you got to learn reality. And African centered education is an education in what is real. We talked about today how the United States could fight the Japanese and fight the Germans. And then another day become allies. But that's the way the world is built, ladies and gentlemen. Because you act in terms of your peoplehood. People treat you all right, people support you, people don't get in your way and use you, fine, you work with them. But when they get in your way and so forth, you got to deal with them. This, uh, the Latino uh, segment of the American population is growing faster than the black population. And it, a good portion of it is an entrepreneurial population. And they will be used as cannon fodder by the white supremacists against black interests when it fits their needs. So you can't get deceived by momentary feelings of harmony and so forth. And let me tell you something else, black people, because I see too many black people trying to save every other people but themselves. themselves as 
any people should. Understand? I have no jealousy, no envy, no hatred because these people are taking care of their families. That's what a other people are supposed to do. I am just concerned as to why we are not doing the same. And so they, they say they own over half of these 167 stores. They own the 37 new Bravo stores, almost entirely Dominican. All told, the region's Dominicans sell more than a billion dollars worth of groceries a year. The Dominican grocery business owners who succeed, as well as Mr. Diaz, have followed a quick, steep route to six-figure incomes. Often they plant their stores in tough neighborhoods where major chains have pulled out for some reason. Who is the tough neighborhood? <laughs> you know where it is. <laughs> ah, we gotta, we gotta bring it to a close. You must operate in terms of race. You have no other choice. Tell it, tell it. You understand? Now I am here, what they call a, a, a chart here of social standing, where they have measured the social standing of ethnic groups in this country. Uh, and, and across the world, apparently. At the, at, out of the nine point scale, which implies the highest, down to one. With the what, native, and like that, native white American. <laughs> <laughs> and this, was, this measure was taken in 1989. 7.03, of course they had the top of the whole deal. And from there, the father, British, Protestants, Catholics, Irish, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and down to the bottom of the list, we get Negroes. 4.17. And this where's this racial harmony taking place? Where's this melting pot occurring? Only one step above Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and Gypsies. This network, not mine. They ask people to, to evaluate the standing of ethnic groups. They own ethnic groups with other ethnic groups, and that's where it's come out. You're, you're going to have to make it through the top, through your own power, and under your own power. And the people you see at the top are the people who got no, no power, man. It's no, it's no accident. There. So now, uh, we're going to jump over there. We're going to check out here another thing. Let me just say something real quick here. So we need to study European power. We need to see how it's put together, because it's put together the system, its weaknesses and its strength. We need to look at the origins of power. Anthropologists in their study of human culture have been able to document that the exercise of power and the division of labor with um, a labor within the family constitute the most basic power relationship, the one from which true power structures develop. I'm quoting now from Dye's book on power. But as he's saying here, that power begins where? In the what? Home. In the family structure. There are many ways you can look at families. We must not only look at black families, whether it's own welfare or welfare, where it is headed by a, a man or not or what have you. But a family also represents a set of power relationships. The, the word father, the word mother, son, daughter represent power relationships. They represent status relationships. That is why we recognize the abuse of parental power creates what? Personality problems and can cripple children forever. The judicious and wise use of parent power can create beautiful and wonderful and positive children. In other words, then, parents have power and there's a structure of power relations within the family which lays up the child's and the person's attitude toward power, how they will use power, how they will relate to power for the rest of their lives. And that is why the family has to be appropriately organized in terms of this power relationship. And that is why the oppressor wishes to distort and disrupt the black family and have it uh, misidentify itself and make itself dysfunctional. In doing so then, its relationship to power 
And when you talk about criminality, we talk about what? Our uh, relationship to authority. What are you talking about then? A power relationship. Does your father have authority? Does your mother have authority? And in a sense then, they are not only your mother and your father, but they are the symbols of authority and they laid the script for your relationship to authorities throughout the society itself. Right. And consequently then, how we organize our families and how we relate to each other sets the basis for how we relate to power and whether we develop power. Right. And one of the major reasons why this system oppresses the economic system of African people is so that it can disrupt the power relations in the African family and therefore disrupt my people. You must note that the black family and that the family serves major function. It is a mini society within itself. It is a nation within itself. And it is a sin, it is a microcosmic nation. And it is a preparation for the individual's behavior in the macrocosmic nation. Look at what the family functions do. It regulates sexual behavior, reproductive behavior, socialization behavior, affectional behavior, status function, protection, and economic functioning. A family is an economic unit. And the way it shares its economic resources, the way it deals with its economic resources, lays the ground for how the nation deals with its economic resources. You have to understand that. And therefore, the restructuring of the family is a restructuring for power. The true political power organization begins with the development of power relations between family and kinship groups. The basic power structures of voluntary alliances of families and clans who acknowledge the same leaders habitually work together in economic enterprises, agree to certain uh, ways of conduct for the maintenance of peace among themselves, and cooperate in the conduct of offensive and defensive warfare. Thus, power structures are, are born within the development and cooperation between families and kinship groups. A part of Afrocentric uh, education is education for familyhood. When we talk about taking these boys out, we are training them to be fathers. We're training them to be husbands. We're training them how to relate to each other socially. We're training them to build a team spirit which will be used against their oppressors. Right. Look at the way this, this white man had you organized today. You can get a bunch of black men who are willing to call themselves bulls. You know, Chicago bulls, and the bulls, and bulls. They can wear the same uniforms, right? You see it all the time, you look at it all the time. They don't talk about it. They coordinate their behavior, don't they? Yeah, they organize as a team. And they run over any bunch of white men they see. As long as it's where? On the football field or the basketball court. And somehow they are unable to take that team spirit, that willingness to act around one activity, off of the court, and overrun their enemies. And you sit there and watch it. You must ask, why is it that these men cannot take the kind of organization that they represent, the kind of identity? the kind of synchrony and all of these other things that they represent on the court. They're giving permission to be white men there. Now they're looking for permission to be white men in other places. A true African-centered education then will train these boys not only in team behavior on the basketball and the football courts, but train them to operate as a team in the world and to overrun white men. not multicultural education. And you see here, they must come together in terms of conduct. We 
got a lot of people out here who think good manners is, 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 is not good. We got a lot of young men growing up out here who think to have good manners and to conduct oneself well is, is effeminate. You don't understand it. Good manners are not just plain things. Good manners are the means by which a group uh, maintains its organization, maintains its stability, maintains a certain level of expectation and predictability within itself maintains harmony. It's a system of working off tension and seeing the tension is directed in another way other than destroying the harmony of a people. So good manners is an essential part of a people's ethnicity and people's power. And that's why again when I talk about African-centered education, we must talk about training our people in good manners and in etiquette. I know you don't like the word, but that's what it's about because it's a part of how related. When you look at the great religions you talk about here, you must again, you must recognize that the great religions not only talk about praying to Jesus <laughs> and calling on his name, that's a part of it, but great religions also instruct people in how to relate one to the other. Honor thy mother, and they follow. You see, when you look in the great religions, you will see they also have codes of what? Conduct. And that is a part of the people's power. You see. And great teachers teach Confucius on what? Conduct and behavior. A great deal of the Asian unity comes out of the teachings of Confucius. What they call filial piety and fidelity and so forth. I'll be asleep. You haven't got to make it here. Okay. I think it's just I got a captive audience here. I'm going to work it out. I'm going to be a man. Goodbye, everybody. But anyway. I just want you to see, to get an idea of what we're talking about, we're talking about African considered education and what a preparation for taking power involves. And what must be done? We must have a sense of territoriality. You gotta be, you gotta be people, and if you're a people, you gotta have a sense of territoriality. And you don't feel good when other people are invading your territory. And I said today, we, it, it offends my territoriality when I walk out and see Koreans and every other people on the black community. And yet you got, you got some people who want to argue, you know, about citizenship. But now, now watch this business. I'm telling you, you're only free to do the wrong thing. Now where is the greatest sense of territoriality in the black community today? In what? Not there. You got it. Crack. They will shoot each other, protect what they're turned, murder and kill to protect what they call what? Territory. In other words, they got the Negro mind so messed up, he will only murder and kill and fight to have the right to engage in the destruction of his people. We will only fight each other so that we can destroy each other. This sense of territoriality then must be elevated onto all of the other levels. And it has to be a territory about grocery stores and gas stations and cleaners and everything else because that's our territory. Okay, we're going to bring it here to a close. We got to look at our sources of power. We got plenty of power in the black community. We got a consumer market out here. Yes, we got a consumer market in. We buy a lot, but we're not using that consumer power correctly. You can see from what I read today, everybody values black folks' money. Which gives you what? Power. Power. And you gotta use it. Now you use it if you say, brother, to get what? Economic, some kind of equality to spend our money with white folks. Now you gotta use it 
to get control of your own markets. You see, you got it. Look what's going on here. I, 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 I got it. I want to talk a little bit about the UNCF and the Blue Rods. The Blue Rods charade and the Budweiser game and this buck dancing for pennies. Yes. Singing and hollering your lungs out for nickels. Oh yes. Being multicultural to death. Oh yes. You got to look at it for what it is. That thing actually involves the finance and the poor black education. You talk about 41 so-called black colleges. You raise 10 or 11 million dollars. You're not raising one million dollars for each one of those schools. And when you count administrative costs and other things, they'll be lucky if they get a couple hundred thousand dollars out of it. And yet you spend 250 million dollars. And then you have the insult of Budweiser, some joker, coming up here giving you a $10,000 check, a $50,000 check. When according to your information, brother, Black people, along I guess with Latinos, spend $600 million a year buying beer and liquor. <laughs> and you're supposed to bow and scream when somebody walks up and hands you $10,000. They should be beaten on camera. <laughs> for three and four doggone hours. The people have stolen your money and used your money to hand you nickels and buy you back for less than a penny. And you got Honey Charm as co-host. Oh yes. Filled with groups that are sucking the black community. Honey Charm, who is this? The Asian people. In harmony. If you had your own stores and your own yourself, you wouldn't have to be there begging and have the common talk and say the dumb talk. You got white newsmen on there. People spend all of the year assassinating the character of black people. Pretending they have to raise money for black people. This game is a farce. And selling black people on the idea that education will solve all their problems. That's the biggest lie you'll ever hear. I want some of you to come over to the, to the Pan, uh, Pan African Research um, and Development Foundation, because we're going to do some solid research. Yes, sir. We're going to do some solid research. We want to find out how much money black people spend with these various companies. Number one, we're going to find out how many millions they give to white colleges of black folks' money. You understand? And how many nickels they give to black folks. Okay? And we're going to get this information together and we're going to start a rumble here. We're going to start, oh yes, because what are we talking about? If you're talking about six hundred million dollars a year, you're talking about something like fifty million dollars a month. And somebody's gonna walk up and give you a ten thousand dollar check, a fifty thousand dollar check. All you gotta do is boycott them for one week and they'll give you ten million dollars. You don't have to bet, you got to buy the balls. I don't have time to read to you what eight of uh, uh, William Coors. And those people say about black people. Right. And how how poor is beer finances the Heritage Foundation? How poor is beer finances the most far right groups and skinheads and Nazi groups in this country in the And yet they have nerve to put Coors gold and the silver bullet in your places of, 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 of livelihood. That means you got power there. Now I want us to move into the space age. I had a I have a catalog here that claims they have six 
million black families, the addresses of six million black families. In other words, we can create a mailing list of six million black families. We can create a mailing list of ten million black families. It's time for the nationalists to computerize those six million black people. It's time for the nationalists to get themselves a computer that writes letters that vote in the vote would stand on letters and direct the addresses black people and give them that research data and let them know what's happening and so let's squeeze the ball on the booty. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave. I'm a runaway slave.